Well, happy Easter. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Yes, yes. Uh, happy Easter to you. Uh, it's interesting as we uh, embrace the narrative of Jesus. We've been in the season of Lent, and uh, we've been talking as a church about some of the normal elements that uh, surround the, the, the death of Jesus, the life of Jesus, that kind of point us to Christ. We've talked about uh, wood and water and cloth, and uh, we've been looking at the story of Jesus and observing Lent and leaning into uh, just this journey of what our sin costs and, and what death looks like, and, and there's just this heaviness, and on Easter you wake up, you take a deep breath, and you feel that there's just life in the air, except the life of Jesus is not a happy story. And it's really not even a success story, it's a salvation story. And the one that's being saved and has been saved is you and I. And so we wake up today knowing that if we accepted the work of the cross, we've been saved from hell, death, and the grave. And we celebrate today not just the fact that Jesus is alive, but we celebrate the reality that if we align our lives with Christ, we actually have life in Christ as well. And so we don't just celebrate Jesus' life, we celebrate our life. So whatever part of you is dead inside, a hope, a dream, a relationship, an idea, a goal, we can bring that to Christ. And Jesus gives us life if we'll allow him to, and so we don't just celebrate life on Easter. But we get to celebrate life tomorrow. Tomorrow is Resurrection Monday, and Tuesday is Resurrection Tuesday, and Wednesday is Resurrection Wednesday, and on and on and every week we gather together to celebrate the reality that Christ is alive. And so maybe you're familiar with the story, I'm sure most of you are, but Jesus came uh, and lived as a, a normal human being born of virgin birth and, and, and lived a and, uh, sinless life. And he died a, 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 a brutal and gruesome death on the cross, and he was buried in a tomb. And he was uh, prophesied that he would actually rise in three days. He would come back to life, and that's where we get Easter, and we get uh, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday, and, and Easter Sunday. And, and the interesting thing about the story of Jesus and the prophecy of Jesus is that nobody really believed it. And if we're honest, if you take your head out of, you know, whatever it's in, the, the, the filter that we have where, you know, you've probably been raised in church most of your life, you've heard the story of Jesus forever. If we set that aside and we really view this story through the lens of someone who's never heard it before, this is kind of hard to believe. That, that a man would uh, live and, and, and be part God and part man and he would die and, and he would go to a grave and he would come back to life, it's hard to believe and some of you even today may struggle with the story of Jesus, and I understand. I completely understand why you wouldn't believe a man died uh, for sins he didn't commit and, and went to the grave and came back to life, and even harder that he's going to come back again for us one day. However, when you begin to realize the weight of our sin, the gravity of our mistakes, we all of a sudden desire the story of Jesus. I just don't want the story of Jesus to be true. I need it to be true. I need the salvation story to be true in my life because I need saving, saving from myself and from my choices, saving from the weight of my sin. And so as we enter into this uh, final week of our conversation called Icon, we talk about the stone the stone is an interesting uh, concept as we look at what it means for us in relation to Jesus. We turn to the scriptures in Matthew 27. Verse 57, it says, when it was evening, a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph came, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. He approached Pilate and he asked for Jesus' body. And then Pilate ordered that it be released. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean, fine linen, and he placed it in his new tomb, which he had cut into the rock. He left after rolling a great stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were seated there facing the tomb. In context here, Jesus has died. The body is being held. Joseph is saying, hey, I've created a tomb. I've carved it out of rock. Uh, I spent my own time, my own money to, to make it, and I want to put Jesus's body there. He found fine linen. He, he wrapped it all up, and he takes Jesus's body. And what's interesting is that Joseph and the two Marys were eyewitnesses to Jesus's death. They saw firsthand that Jesus died on the cross that day. No breath, no pulse, dead and, and he was wrapped, and they wrapped him in, in this cloth, the, cloth, the tr Shroud of Turin is what it's called, and they buried him in a tomb. And then, as it was customary, they covered the tomb up with a stone. 
They rolled a stone in front of it to seal in uh, all kinds of things. They didn't want animals in or smells in. They didn't want anybody out. They wanted to, to leave it closed. It was very customary. So there's nothing abnormal in culture transpiring up to this moment. But he uses rock to create the tomb, but he uses a stone to conceal it. The difference between a rock and a stone, a rock is a naturally occurring element. A stone, though, was created for purpose. A stone was cultivated and carved and sanded and, and filed and created for a reason, for intentionality. And the stone used to cover Jesus' tomb was there for a reason. It had a purpose, and it was made to keep Jesus in, and it was made to keep everyone else out. And I begin to realize in our lives, I feel like we create stones to keep Jesus where we want him, to make sure that Jesus is in his place. After all, every single one of us, whether you'll admit it or not, love control. We love to be in control, have control. And so the question we have to ask is, why do we try to control Jesus? Why do we feel capable, qualified? Why do we desire to control Jesus? Now your first response, your automatic response is, I don't do that. That's not me. And yet, when we begin to unpeel the layers, we realize that's all of us. At some level, we all want Jesus, but we want a manageable Jesus, a controlled Jesus. We want Jesus that we can manipulate or use or control. We use the stone as a way to harness Jesus, keep him in his place, and we create things in our lives that keep Jesus where he's supposed to be. And for some, this is where Jesus is supposed to be, so we leave him here. We leave, we seal the stone up, Jesus stays, we go about our own business. For others, Jesus is in your home, but he's not in your workplace. He's not in the places you visit or the places you go. He's not in the conversations you have, but he's in his place, and we compartmentalize Jesus in a way where he's there, and we believe in him, but he's compartmentalized and controlled and, and we keep Jesus in a safe place where we can use him when we need to and interact with him when we want to and we want Jesus but we want a Jesus that we are in control of. We want Jesus to like all the people we like. We want him to hate all the people we hate. We want him to vote the way we vote and work the way we vote and we want, to, we want Jesus to live like us. And if we're honest and we look back and we see the Jesus that we worship most often is created in our own image. He looks like us and likes things that we like and listens to all the same music and eats all the same food. And, and we look back and we realize we're not really worshiping Jesus, we're worshiping an idol that eerily resembles Jesus. When we try to control him, we're creating Jesus in our own image. And we love our own image. We love our own image. And so some of us have fallen madly and deeply in love with Jesus who looks just like you, who looks just like me. And that's an idol. And the Bible tells us we shouldn't have any idols, but in the context of Jesus and the church, and it looks so much like him, we don't feel like it's an idol, and yet we realize that Jesus isn't uh, moving and, 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 and leading us, but we keep asking him to follow us. Do what I say, do what I need you to do. And prayer is usually a form of manipulation. God, I want you to do what I want you to do. And rarely do we use it as a way to get to know God or to follow him better. We use it as to try to control Jesus, but a captive Jesus is not Jesus at all. It's an idol. And we think that we can contain and control him, but Jesus is not ours to control. When we realize we cannot control Jesus, we replace him with things we can control. Because, again, we have to be in control. We try to fix ourselves, or we lean on a spouse or a friend, or some people even come to church to try to get better. Not Jesus, but church. And you've been told church can save you, church can't save you, a pastor can't save you, your friends can't save you, a uh, spouse can't save you. It's only Jesus. But because we can control where we go to church, we'll change where we go to church. I'll go over here because I can control that. And maybe this Jesus that's preached at this church fits more of, of me and my style. And, and so we use our elements and the things that we can control to try to manipulate and move things around. But we're afraid, honestly, at the core of all of our being, we're afraid to allow Jesus to have too much say in our lives because it might change how we spend. It might change how uh, we treat others. It might change what we do and where we go and how we worship. It might change the life that we've so carefully curated. If we allow Jesus to actually be who he desires to be in our lives, it might 
take some effort in our part to change. And we might have to admit that we've been doing some things incorrectly. That we might have to admit that we've been a little ugly to people and we've misused income and we've done some things that are harmful. And so our best efforts, we try to control Jesus. But at some point, we come to the realization that we don't need to control Jesus. We're not capable. I'm not God. He is. And so we did then conceal Jesus. When do we conceal Jesus in our lives? There are moments, times, where we place Jesus in his box, where we put him where we think he should be, and we allow him to be everything he wants to be in that one space. All right, I'm coming to church. I walk in the door. Jesus, you can say anything you want, do anything you want, but I'm leaving you here. This is where you live. I'm not going to take you to work because at work I got work friends and I can be my work self. And and I'm not going to take you home because I'm my home self. This is where you are. And we're not controlling him. He can do anything he wants and say whatever he wants. We're just concealing him. And when we realize we can't control him, concealing him is our best effort to hide him away. And we fashion our schedules in such a way where Jesus is largely irrelevant five, six days of the week. We fortify him behind a wall of our own making and we want to hide him away. And in Matthew 27, we find that that's exactly what they do with Jesus. They put him in the tomb. They hide him away the next day, it says, which followed the preparation day. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. And they said, sir, we remember that when this deceiver was still alive, he told everyone, he said, after three days, I'll rise again. Therefore, give orders that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come, steal him away, and tell the people he's been raised from the dead. Then the last deception will be worse than the first. You have a guard of soldiers, Pilate told them. Go and make it as secure as you know how. Then they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting the guard. In context, what's happening is everybody knows, hey, Jesus is going to rise from the dead in three days. But nobody believed it. They figured it was a scheme. And after all, it's a pretty good way to build momentum if you want to start your own uh, organization. You can say that you're going to die. You can organize a group of people to come steal your body in three days. You can say you came back to life. And then maybe people will follow you. And they were on to the scheme. They said, this is not going to happen with us. We're not going to be fooled again. So I want you to take soldiers And I want you to seal it the best that you possibly know how. These were not hacks. These were trained professionals. They were going to seal this area the best they knew how. This wasn't uh, an amateur job. This was a serious deal. And I don't know if anyone in in human history has ever had their tomb sealed with armed guards and soldiers like Jesus did. But they were terrified. So afraid that they were going to get tricked again and that people were going to buy in and believe and thousands of years later people would pack churches and celebrate a risen Savior because uh, the disciples stole him. And so they fortified this tomb. They secured it. And it's not a bad plan uh, if you want to make sure that what's inside stays inside and what's outside stays outside. But the reality is nobody believed that a resurrection would actually transpire. They didn't believe that Jesus would come back to life. They believed that somebody would steal his body. And so he was dead, he was gone, he was hidden away, and now he's being guarded. And I wonder how many times in our lives we try to conceal Jesus and we fortify him, we hide him away. How many times do we bury Jesus behind our attitude or our theology or our own desires? Maybe it's a personality or a vibe and we hide Jesus away. We use him when we have something to gain, but we hide him when we feel like it might create a conflict in our relationships or our businesses or whatever. We often conceal Jesus when we don't have an accurate depiction of who he really is. I think a lot of us are afraid to allow Jesus to permeate every aspect of our lives because we don't exactly know what that might look like. I mean, the usual narrative of of what Jesus did on the cross is that people were so bad And God was so angry with them that he couldn't forgive them unless something big took place. And so we sent Jesus to take the rap for all of our sin. And and the narrative is, you are awful, you're a terrible person, and God is so angry, and Jesus had to die. But nothing really could be further from the truth. It was love, not anger, that brought Jesus here on earth. It was love, not anger, that put Jesus on the cross. It was love, not anger, that put Jesus in the tomb. It was love, not anger, that brought Jesus out of the tomb. And it will be love, not anger, that brings Jesus back for us one day. The overwhelming statement throughout Scripture is God loves us unconditionally. And we often approach God like he's a police officer. 
If you're driving around town or on the interstate and you see an officer, we've been told that you can go like five to ten miles over. Uh, I don't know who started that rumor. Uh, I've not been pulled over, so I guess it's good. Uh, But when you see an officer, you pump the brakes. You just do. And a lot of us live with God much the same way. When we're moving, operating, living, we go, oh, I don't want to get caught. I don't want God to ticket me. I don't want to get in trouble. And we imagine bad things happen because of our sin. And, And yet the reality is we live in a fallen world. We just do. And scripture tells us it rains on the just and the unjust and and bad things happen. They happen to good people and they happen to bad people and they don't seem to happen to bad people often enough but they do happen to good people a lot. And the reality is God is not sitting around waiting to cause harm to us. He's not waiting to catch us in a nefarious act. Every good and perfect thing comes from heaven above. God loves us overwhelmingly and he wants to bring good in our life which is why Jesus came. He came to give us life, but not just regular, normal, everyday, average, boring life. He came to give us life in abundance. And sometimes harmful things happen, but they're to point us back to a God who loves us and cares for us. That when we are at our worst, God's actually at his best. And he's working, and he's creating, and he's doing something in us. But the reality is you can never be good enough That's not an excuse to not try, but you can't be good enough to deserve the unmerited, undeserved grace that comes through the work of the cross. And so when we realize how much God loves us, our natural response is to love him in return. And many of us have made that decision throughout our lives. We love God in return because God loves first, and so the scriptures tell us that God loved us first, so we then are able to respond, and that's where we live. When we realize we can't control him, when we can't conceal him, we love God, but the natural product is often that we end up commemorating Jesus. I don't know uh, why we decide to commemorate Jesus, but we often commemorate Jesus like we would someone who's passed away. We create a headstone. It's got their name and their date, their death and their birth, or vice versa, and, uh, and we commemorate Jesus. And some of us in this room, we used to follow Christ, maybe when you were a kid, Maybe when you were a teenager, your 30s or 40s, and, and you followed Christ, and over time, maybe you uh, just lost hope and you walked away from Jesus. We come back and we commemorate him. There's a stone there, there's a headstone, and maybe this is that moment for you where we come to church periodically and we commemorate Jesus. We represent him, we understand he, he did some great things, and I used to follow him, and we come back and we pay homage to what he has done in the past. I think the most dangerous stone that we can have is the commemorative stone. Because the commemorative stone actually feels legitimate. It feels right to come into a room like this every so often and to sing songs to Jesus and to remember how great it was in the past. To remember what Jesus did a long time ago and, and, and how good he used to be. And when we start talking about the crucifixion and death, and we often end up living there. After all, Agreeing and believing in death is a lot easier than believing in a resurrection. Death is the most normal thing that we all experience in our lives. We can understand death. Resurrection's a different deal. It's harder to have faith to believe that Jesus came back to life than it is to believe that he died. We can believe that something dies. We understand that. But if I told you something came back to life, you go, I got to fact check it. It's not true. I've never seen this happen before. And so a lot of us end up living in the death of Jesus. We commemorate the death of Jesus, and one of the dangers or pitfalls of Lent is that sometimes we get stuck there. Lent is a season where we want to lean into our sin and the weight, and we want to feel how how the the ick and the gross and the the heaviness of sin. We want to lean into the death of Jesus, and and we have uh, Friday, and uh, we have Holy Saturday where we just feel the weight of it. And I don't know if you felt it yesterday. I I did. I felt just this emptiness. There's just this liminal space But we don't stay there. And some of us were stuck there. Some of you even now are stuck there where you understand the gravity of your sin and you understand how bad it is and how bad you are and you understand that Jesus died and you're still there. And Maybe you've been there for months. Maybe you've been there for weeks. Maybe you've been there for years. But we've created a tomb and a stone where Jesus was and we say, that's it. That's where he's at. 
and we stop feeling alive and we stop believing and we stop worshiping. We just commemorate and we honor the memory of Jesus with a ceremony every Sunday with songs and readings of scriptures and we leave once again having gone to a funeral service and we turn our churches into funeral homes and our worship services and memorial services and people park, uh, pack rather their churches uh, not actually believing that he's alive because that takes a lot of faith. And in Luke's telling of the scriptures, we find that two women are going to pay their respects to Jesus. And in context, these women were told that Jesus would die and that he would come back to life. They were told the prophecies. Jesus himself said, hey, uh, this is going to happen. And so here we are in the moment, and they're walking to go visit Jesus on the third day. And in Luke 24, verse 1, it says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing spices that they had prepared And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now it's fascinating to me that these two women heard Jesus say, I'm going to die. They saw him die. They heard Jesus say before he died, I'm going to come back to life in three days. And now they're visiting him three days later in the tomb. And not only are they shocked that the stone is rolled away, they actually go into the tomb to see if he's still there because after all, a stone could magically roll away, but body could still be there. Not only did they do all of that, but beforehand they prepared spices to put on his body to help with decay and so on. There was a lot of intentionality and effort going into visiting a tomb, fully expecting a body, even though Jesus had already told them I was going to leave. Now, I've got a terrible memory. I just do. Uh, I don't know my kids' birthdays very often. Uh, I struggle to remember the anniversary. I don't really even know exactly how old I am. I just guess every time someone asks. And so I guess that's how old I am. And so uh, I don't have a great memory. But if someone told me they were going to die and come back to life in three days, I'm probably going to commit that to core memory. I'm probably going to hang on to that one. I'm probably going to recall it often. When they die, I'm going to go, oh yeah, I remember. They said they were coming back to life. I'm going to bring that back. But for some reason, these two women, no fault of their own, did not remember that Jesus was coming back to life. And they were living as if Jesus wasn't really telling the truth. Even though they had seen the miraculous before, they still failed to believe that he was going to come back to life. How many times have you and I seen God do remarkable, beautiful, wonderful, God-like things? We keep forgetting. We keep forgetting. And they were actively preparing spices here, fully planning to find Jesus in the tomb in verse 4. While they were perplexed, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. I've always wanted to figure out what dazzling clothes means. I've always wanted to do it, just a whole sermon on what these guys look like. But we're not going to today. Verse 5. So the women were terrified, I guess at the dazzling clothes, and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. He's not here, but he has been resurrected. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. It was in that moment. They go, oh yeah, I forgot. They needed men in dazzling clothes to remind them. I want to be that man in dazzling clothes for you today. I want to remind you today that Jesus is not dead. He's alive and he's well and he's working and he's moving and I don't want you to forget. I want today to be the catalyst of your life where you go, oh yes, I'm not here to commemorate Jesus. I'm here to celebrate Jesus. He's alive and he's well and these women suddenly remember and and, and we don't really uh, live our lives as if Jesus is alive and I don't want that to be the case for us. I don't want us to go around putting effort into preparing for a body When Jesus is alive and he's working and he's moving, he's not here, the men said. The stone was removed. It's been rolled away. But the stone was not rolled away so Jesus could walk out. The stone was rolled away so that we could get to him. It wasn't removed so he could walk out. Jesus proves this later on in this really strange encounter with the disciples where he shows up and he just walks through the door for no reason. Like no one even asked. He just walks through the door. He's proving to us right here he could have walked out of the tomb. But he chose to roll the stone away. Why? Because he wants us to know that we have access to him. But you know what happens? You and I keep rolling the stone back. 
The stones rolled away. And we go, no, 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 let's put it back. I want to control Jesus. Stones rolled away. No, 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 I want to, I want to conceal him. Let's put it back. Stones rolled away. No, 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 we're going to commemorate Jesus in this moment. I prefer to imagine him dead in this tomb. And so I put the stone back, and it keeps getting moved, and the angel said he's not here, he's risen. And at this point, the resurrection was unconceivable, and these women in this moment go, oh, wow. He was right. The story of Jesus, though, it wasn't 2,000 years ago. The story of Jesus is alive and well in your life and in mine. And the story of Jesus wasn't 2,000 years ago. We're still telling the story of Jesus. Every miracle and every beautiful and wonderful thing transpires. Every sunrise and every sunset is a reminder Jesus is still working and he's moving. And if you were here and you came through one of our doors, hopefully you did, not through a wall, but you were given a stone. I want you to grab that stone wherever you are. I want you to hold that stone in your hands. Feel how smooth it is. It was cultivated and carved out. For a, for a specific purpose. This stone is a reminder. Uh, it's a small reminder of the stone that was used to conceal the tomb. And what's interesting is one stone's pretty light. And I think everybody was handed one stone when they came in. Uh, but I, I put the baskets at the door, and there's like 15 or 20, maybe 50 in there. And it gets heavier. One stone's easy to move. One stone's easy to throw away or toss. I'm not advocating you throw it in this moment, but you could, and because one's easy. And for a lot of us, we create a stone. It's like, ah, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Just move it out of the way. But two, three, five, 100, 200. See, some of us come into this room with thousands of pounds of weight between us and God. And God didn't put that there. We've put it there. Doubt and shame and guilt and condemnation and disappointment and loss of hope and loss of a dream and all of these things. And we've stacked all of this up. And Jesus is over there going, just move some stones I'm right here, I'm alive, and I'm moving, and I'm working. I just need you to move these out of the way, or just walk around them. And we're the ones that just keep stacking the stones. They quickly become unmanageable. And some of us feel so disconnected from Christ today because we have so much in the way. But I believe what God wants to do this morning is he wants to remove those things. He wants to remove the barriers between us and Christ. I want you to ask yourself this morning, what stones am I stacking? I know you've been broken. I know you've been hurt. I know you've been disappointed. But instead of stacking the stones, let's move them. Or just lay them at Jesus' feet. That if you believe in Jesus' death and his resurrection, what I know is true for you and me is our soul begins to come alive again. The things we thought would never transpire breathe life again. Relationships that died come back businesses or ideas or money or whatever that looks like, your health. When we, when we lay the things that have died in our lives at the feet of Jesus, God has this beautiful way of bringing life to death because that's what he does. That's his whole thing. But so many of us have stacked so many barriers. So the next time you feel dead inside, next time you encounter something that looks like it's broken or, or lost, I want you to remind yourself I'm alive. Jesus is alive in me. That Jesus' resurrection proves that God can bring life to death, that nothing is too far gone, nothing is uh, too distant, nothing is too broken. Life is possible. And if there's a part of you that feels dead inside a dream or a family member or whatever, bring it to Christ and, and bring life back into whatever has passed, that God wants to bring life into your life because that's exactly what he does best. And when we walk away from an encounter with him, we truly understand what it means to be alive. Have you ever known people that just have something about them? There's just like a sparkle. There's just a thing. Uh, one of Estella's teachers, we noticed really quickly, we're like, there's just something different in a good way. You know, we've met people that were different in a not good way, but there's something different. And we later on find out, yeah, she's a believer, and, and on and on. We're like, we knew it. We confirmed it. Because there's something inside of us, if we'll stop controlling and concealing and commemorating, there's something that comes out of us, exudes from every part of us that just goes before us, and people go, there's something different. You're not perfect, you're not completely sinless, but you're driven. There's something inside of you that, that, that's coming out and that's what God wants to be is that light inside of you. And in Matthew 28 it says, so departing quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, they ran to tell the disciples the news. Just then Jesus met them and said, good morning. I love that. It's like the most normative greeting. It's like, good morning. You know, he must have had like this weird smile on his face, like he knew what he was doing. And he says, good morning. And they came up and they took hold of his feet and they worshiped him and then Jesus told them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. Two things Jesus says and I want you to take with you. Don't be afraid. 
and go tell everybody about me. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to allow Jesus to be who he wants to be in your homes, in your workspaces, in your business, in your life, your marriage, your relationships. Don't be afraid to allow Jesus to be present in every aspect of your life. And that'll be the testimony that people will see that we will tell others about Christ. He says, don't be afraid and tell everyone. But it's not enough for you to find life, but we have to commit our lives to helping others find life too. If you found life in Jesus, let's go help others find it as well. In Romans 6, it says, death no longer rules over Jesus for in light of the fact that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But in the light of the fact that he lives, he lives to God, so you too consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We're dead to sin. We're dead to sin in this room if we'll accept the work of the cross. We are dead to sin, but all of a sudden we become alive in Christ. And so when you find something that's dead, we bring it to God and we say bring life back to it. But here's the reality is on the cross, Jesus said it is finished. He didn't say I'm finished, meaning the work of the cross was complete, but he's still at work in your life and in mine. And so Jesus is still alive doing beautiful and wonderful things, so don't hide him. Don't control him, don't commemorate him, but let's celebrate Jesus this morning. If you would bow your head and close your eyes today. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you sent your son to die on the cross for sins he didn't even commit. And even though the story seems really unbelievable, when we begin to understand the weight of our sin, we begin to understand the beauty of the narrative of the cross. And so we thank you today for those of us that are walking in fear, for those of us that are trying to control or manipulate or commemorate or conceal Jesus, Father, may we lay those things aside. May we start unstacking stones this morning. May we start unstacking those stones so that we can get to Jesus again. So Father, we thank you and we praise you. For those in this space that haven't accepted Jesus in their life, God, I ask that today would be the change. And we would begin the conversation that starts with Jesus, I need you. That's the most simple thing we can say. We've overcomplicated salvation, merely coming to Christ, saying I'm a sinner, I need a savior, and I've chosen you as my savior, the only one capable and qualified. I need you. Brings us in right relationship with Christ again. So Father, we need you, we admit that. We admit that we're sinners in thought, word, deed, and action, and we need you. So we praise you and we thank you that you came for us. So we celebrate you today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.